This is me when I was 17. Before falling in love with girls, I fell in love with Apple. I was so obsessed with Apple, I needed to have every single one of their products. And of course, as a young Apple lover, when the iPad 1 came out, I wanted to have it before anybody else. So I was able to convince my parents to go and have a friend in the United States ship one over in advance. The trouble was that at the time this was happening, this giant volcanic eruption in Iceland was going on, and all international air travel was halted. The good news was that the iPad arrived safely, but the case that I ordered never got here. Little did I know that was, that was probably the best thing to have ever happened. So here I am at, the sc at school, having a cappuccino, playing with my new iPad, when all of a sudden this kid comes rushing into the bar, smashing me and almost sending my iPad flying. I was terrorized by this event, and I had to find some solution to protect my iPad from falling. So after lots of thought and processing on how I could solve this problem for myself, I came up with this idea of coming up with a design for a case that would eliminate the risk of it falling altogether. And so that's when the first sketches were made, designing by hand, slowly but surely developing early stage prototypes and developing relationships with a couple contract manufacturers in Guangzhou, we developed the iHandler. The iHandler is our very first product, and it does exactly that, solves the problem from falling. So on the, eight, on the eve of my 18th birthday, our first shipment of 500 cases arrived. I was, I was ecstatic. I was so excited to get my hands on my first batch of product. I picked up the phone, started cold calling, and trying to get as many orders as possible. In fact, that Christmas, while in the United States visiting some family, I went over to the Apple store on Fifth Avenue and figured that would be a great place to start selling product. I mean, everyone that buys iPads goes to the Apple store to buy it, and they're going to buy cases there as well. So instead of going for the traditional route of going through Apple corporate, trying to get into the buying department, I decided I would take a slightly more alternative approach. I would rock up to the store with a backpack full of cases and start slinging cases to anyone that walked by the iPad case department. Now, it was a little bit um, risky, and I did make a few sales, but then eventually security kicked me out and asked me not to come back for soliciting, their pro soliciting products inside. But it was a great experience, and it was the first real kind of entrepreneurial perseverance that I needed to have to get going. This was our first client, Silver's Luggage and Gifts. Not, a, not exactly the prestigious Apple store that I had in mind, but it was definitely a good start, and although they sold toothbrushes, car parts, wigs, you know, they bought some nutcases, and it was a great first sale. Fast forwarding a few months, I started to wonder a little bit about what are my, what are my cases actually made from? Because the manufacturers that I had been working with specifically told me that they were made out of polycarbonate plastic, which is a durable plastic that would help absorb the shock if they fell. And so one day after school, I decided, why don't I just cut one open to see what they really are made from? And to my shock, it turned out they were all made out of recycled toothpaste boxes. And it was a bit of a scary moment when I realized that all the product I'd been selling were just toothpaste boxes covered by iPad cases. And I freaked out, thought the whole business was going to go down the toilet. But um, fortunately, we were able to recover. And um, it did teach me my first truly valuable lesson in business, which is never give up. You have to persevere no matter what. And even though we didn't find the first manufacturer, we had to keep going and we keep looking until we found another one that could de de develop a product that was higher quality. And so I'm happy to say today, we don't actually work with those factories anymore. We work with um, a couple other ones. And Nutcase has grown into a business that has offices in the UK and in Rome. We sell hundreds of thousands of euros worth of product, and uh, we sell in over 40 countries. So we've come a long way from that little Silver's uh, luggage and gift store. So after high school, take, I decided that it would be a good idea to take a gap year. So I didn't really want to go right to university. I wanted to get some experience. I wanted to learn about the real world of business. So I moved to Guangzhou. I hung out with these great manufacturers and, um, and developed some new products. And upon my return, I did end up listening to my parents. They said, go to university, get a degree, follow the traditional route. And you know, at the same time, you can run your business. You can do it after university. You know, there's no rush. So that's what I did. I went to Lancaster. You know, had some terrible food for a year, and um, in the end, decided that 
I really did have an incredible experience at university, specifically because of the network that I developed. In that network at university, I met a, a key individual who helped me get this opportunity to go and speak and run a workshop on entrepreneurship in Tallinn, Estonia. It was a bit of an odd, you know, odd idea. I was a bit afraid of this, of this proposition, specifically because the audience were going to be 150 graduate students. I was 19, I was running a business called Nutcase, I didn't have a degree, I was afraid. I didn't think I could actually handle it. But I decided I'd go anyway, and so I took a boat, I took a flight, I took a train, I finally got there, ran this workshop, and the experience changed my life entirely. It changed my life entirely because in Estonia, through, through someone in the audience, as a matter of fact, they told me about this different kind of university, a university for entrepreneurs and startup people based in Silicon Valley. It's called Draper University, and it's a school founded by one of the world's leading venture capitalists. So I thought, this has got to be the future for me. I have to be in this environment. And in the summer of 2013, I decided that I would pack my bags. I told my parents I was dropping out of university and moved out to the Bay Area to attend this program. And that was when everything changed for me. So like these very tasteful tattoos, make your own luck. I, too, believe in making my own luck, and I believe the best way to make your own luck is by getting as far out of your comfort zone as possible. Get as far out as possible, because that's where the magic happens. See, a lot of people think that, you know, opportunities just fall out of the sky, but the reality is that you have to be in the right place at the right time, and the only way you can do that is by getting out of your comfort zone. Going to Estonia, that was scary. I didn't know what to expect. But by going there, it set me on a path to California that could have never happened had I not done something scary and risky like that. So while living in California, I would often come back to visit my family in Rome. And this one day, I was waiting for the bus. And as we all know, the public transport here is challenging at times. And it was, it's often not on time. So this one day, I was waiting. And 30 minutes late, I started just observing my surroundings. I started to study the traffic. And what I noticed was that there were hundreds of scooters. There's hundreds upon hundreds of scooters that were driving by. And they all had one thing in common. They all had one person on board, but they were designed for two. And I started thinking, wait a second. If I were in the Bay Area, if I was in the States, someone would have probably come up with an app that connects people waiting at bus stops with people on scooters. And so, I did some market research, checked out the App Store, looked in the Italian App Store, looked on Google, and nothing like that really existed. And that's precisely how my, um, my third startup got founded, Scooterino. We're essentially just an app that connects people who want rides on scooters with scooter drivers that are going in the same direction. It's like a new, a new sharing economy startup. And so my philosophy for starting businesses is really pain-oriented. I like to find a problem in my life, a pain that I experience every day, and I try my very best to solve it. And by solving that problem, if I do it well, it, it just so happens I can resell it or share it with other people. And that's kind of how I started Nutcase based off of the iPad falling and then Scooterino. So after coming up with this idea, I um, moved back to the States. I was, in, I was still in the Bay Area, but that's when the real grind started. The real grind because I was working nights with my team in Italy, working on Scuderina. I was working daytime on another project, and it was incredibly challenging. But we persevered, and slowly but surely, we applied to an incubator here in Italy called Bic Lazio. And Bic Lazio gave us this opportunity to receive 50,000 euros from the European Space Agency. Now, most people think, why on earth would the European Space Agency give you 50,000 euros? And the truth is that because our technology is 90% satellite GPS, that's how, we, um, that's how we figured it out. So then I had to come up with the fundamental question. Do I stay in Silicon Valley and continue working in the tech startup scene there, or do I take a time capsule back to ancient Rome and attempt to start a company in Italy? And it was very challenging. A lot of my friends were like, ma sei matto? I mean, are you kidding me? You come back to Rome to start a tech company? Stay in the Bay Area. You're already there. I mean, what's the point? And so I said to them, listen, in Italy, there's so much opportunity. There are thousands and thousands of opportunities because there's thousands and thousands of problems. And these problems don't even exist in the United States. All you have to do is have an entrepreneurial mindset, focus yourself, and try and solve these specific problems. And little, 
That's exactly what we're doing with Scuderino. So I said, that's it. I'm leaving Silicon Valley. I'm coming back to Rome. And um, this past year has been unbelievably challenging. I got back here a year ago, and there have been obstacles upon obstacles in our way. It's been ridiculously difficult, but we've been persevered. Our team has had a vision, and we've stayed committed to it. And we didn't listen to the naysayers. You know how many people told me, oh, yeah, sure. Take it, starting a company that involves matching people with strangers on scooters is definitely going to be a big success. Everyone thought I was nuts, but I said, whatever, we're going to do it anyway. And so far, we've launched a business eight weeks ago. We've been growing very quickly, and, um, and it's been working out. So when I think about obstacles in my life and challenges, I often think back to Marcus Aurelius and this quote from his meditations. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. Now, all of us have new projects, new ideas, new businesses that we want to start. Do not let those obstacles at the beginning stop you from getting started. Remember to always expect the unexpected because it could all go wrong at any given moment, like we saw with the toothpaste boxes. And whatever you do, allow yourself to focus and persevere, not letting anything else stop you. Thank you.